you hear me? It's working. Okay. Um, just to let you know, for next month in December, we have Mike O'Connor sharing. This will be another Zoom meeting, but he is um, sharing about his travel photography and he volunteers for the world famous Calgary Stampede. So all of his information is going to be on our website and I will send you out some MailChimps as reminders and tell you a little bit about his story. And um, we're tonight we're so excited to have Betsy back, yay. <laughs> um, we've been looking forward to this. She spoke to us last spring and it was awesome. Um, tonight, um, she's going to be speaking to us about capturing motion. Uh, she said, creativity and experimentation motivates Betsy to explore the world of motion photography. A combination of traditional techniques of controlling shutter speed with some non-traditional concepts using camera motion and light painting. Betsy's images inform and inspire us to try new ideas. Using your camera to capture motion in ways beyond what we see with our eyes results in endless creative possibilities. And welcome back, Betsy. We're so glad to have you. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, okay, let me see if I can share my screen and slideshow from beginning. How does that look? Does that look all right? Uh, we do not see your screen. Oh no. Oh no, it's always something. Um, Maybe I didn't hit share screen first. I think I didn't hit share screen first. I just clicked right on it. Okay, that helps. That looks a little better. Okay. okay, all right. All right, slideshow from beginning. How's that? Does that look all right? That looks great. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Well, first, um, thank you, Evie, for inviting me. And I am very happy to be back presenting to your club again. I hope I can provide some inspiration. So I will take a pause about halfway through the presentation and that would be a good time to ask any questions, but Jan, jump in anytime if there's something that you need to mention. If people have specific questions while she's speaking, um, you might want to put them in the, in the chat and I will try to monitor that as well. That sounds good. But again, I'll take a pause halfway through and then of course at the end, I'm happy to answer any other questions. So let's get started. Motion, so many different interpretations. We can freeze a moment in time, capture a special moment, use techniques to manipulate motion, and see things in a different way, different than your eyes can see things. And we can use motion to create a mood or a feeling. So most of the images I will show are mine, but I have included some by my husband, Jim, who was the guilty party that got me into photography about 10 years ago. So on some of the images, you'll see his name in the bottom. I do give him credit. So here are some of the motion techniques that I will cover. We're gonna talk about, of course, freezing action and then long exposure. We'll also do some panning and zooming. We'll talk a little bit about rear curtain sync, which is fun. We have to talk about photographing water. Um, I'll touch on neutral density filters. They can make quite a difference. We'll do some light painting motion, a fun toy called a pixel stick. And then I will wrap up with some fun tricks and some Photoshop ideas where you can simulate motion. And I will include the shutter speed and aperture on most images. And I, by the way, I will share a PDF of the highlights of the presentation. So you don't need to try to take any notes. And you know, I find it's always a challenge creating a presentation for a diverse audience with all different levels of experience. I know like most, most camera clubs that some of your members are just starting out, want to learn the basics. And I know you have many very experienced and talented members. So I'll start out with some basics and gradually add some more advanced techniques. I find there is always something new to learn, some new technique to try out. And while putting this presentation together for you, I learned quite a few new things that I'll share. 
Now, most of this presentation involves in-camera techniques, but again, I will finish up with some post-processing ideas. And my research started with a little bit of history. You may be familiar with this very famous photograph by Henri Cartier-Bresson. It's often used to illustrate what is known as the decisive moment when the visual and psychological elements in a scene briefly come together. So not only did he capture the motion of the man's feet suspended above the water, but look how the reflection in the water, it actually mirrors the image in a circus poster in the background. Pretty cool. And I love this image of a cyclist. It's believed that he found his composition and waited for the cyclist to move into that exact desired position, another decisive moment. So these are examples of freezing a moment in time. So let's move to an, an image that shows motion. Now we're gonna settle a little bit. So there was a businessman named Leland Stanford back in the 1800s, and he wanted to settle a bet with some of his buddies. He contended that when his horse was racing, all four legs came off the ground at the same time. Well, no one had ever seen it, so no one believed it. So he paid Edward Moybridge to prove his point. And the photographer Moybridge, he set up a series of 12 cameras along the track that were triggered by the horse, that tripped the wires, that triggered the shutter release, and he wound up with 12 images. And as you can see, he won his bet. In the third image on the top, all four legs are off the ground. So let's move to a single image that shows motion. Philadelphia artist Thomas Eakins was also a, a photographer. And ironically, he worked alongside Moybridge, the one we just talked about, for a while at the University of Pennsylvania. Well, Eakins developed his own method with the goal of studying anatomy to further his paintings. So whereas Moybridge's system relied on a series of cameras to produce multiple photos, Eakins used a single camera to produce a series of exposures superimposed on one negative. And I want to mention one more from history. A 25-year-old Ansel Adams created this image of the monolith of Half Dome. He first used a yellow filter to darken the sky a bit, but his experience of what he saw was more dramatic than he knew he would get from that yellow filter. So after hiking up a mountain with heavy gear, he had one glass plate left. He tried a new red filter, hoping that it would darken the sky to create the image he imagined or visualized. So this experiment proved to be a turning point for Ansel Adams because for the first time, he was conscious of the difference between what his camera lens saw and what his, mind, what his mind's eye saw as the final print. He discovered photographic visualization. And this is a concept I will mention again later on. So we will be talking a lot about either freezing time, capturing a period of time, either using a fast shutter speed or a slow shutter speed. So most cameras have a, a dial with shutter priority marked on it. So you just set your mode dial to either S for shutter or on some cameras it says TV for time value. And they both activate your shutter priority mode. This means you tell the camera how long you want the exposure to be. And in most cases, you just let the camera decide the rest. So let's start with the most basic of techniques of motion photography. Fast exposures can freeze actions that happen faster than the blink of an eye. This was shot at one two thousandth of a second. And again, people always ask about the settings. Uh, so you can see down here, I do include the aperture and ISO on most images but the most important factor here is shutter speed. A skateboarder in Central Park, frozen in midair at 1 500th of a second. This is my husband, Jim. He's tossing cherry blossoms in the air. And more skateboard antics. This one was taken by Jim. <laughs> I like to imagine what thoughts must be going through the minds of the couple with their feet in the air. So fast shutter speeds are almost always used to capture sporting events, to freeze the action. And in addition to sports, there are many other fleeting moments that the only way to capture is with a fast shutter speed. 
So I don't know if any of you have attempted to photograph frozen soap bubbles. Okay, I <laughs> see Jan shaking her head. It's certainly cold enough up where you live because um, I've tried and failed numerous times before getting it. If it isn't cold enough, and it's for me, I found it's gotta be like under 18 degrees and that doesn't happen that often here. I guess it does there. <laughs> Or if there's any wind at all, your bubbles will pop before you have a chance to push the shutter and be, uh, be prepared to freeze your fingers off. And you have to be fast because they usually don't last long. And I was happy to get this one right at the moment of exploding. But if you can capture these elusive bubbles, you may get some beautiful crystal formations like these. When photographing wildlife like this grizzly bear in British Columbia, I wanted to be sure to freeze any movement to get a sharp image. So one five hundredth of a second can freeze action. For faster action like birds in flight, you probably wanna go with maybe one one thousandth, one two thousandths of a second. So again, these images are all taken with the camera set to shutter priority. Now the automatic setting of shutter priority is great for many things, especially motion photography but a basic knowledge of how the camera works will lead to far more creative photography. By making adjustments to either your aperture or your ISO, you can further control the exposure or amount of light, control the amount of noise or the graininess, or control the depth of field or how much of your image is in, in, uh, in focus. So I wanna point out the magic of a fast shutter speed. I'm not a bird photographer, but I did have a goal of capturing a hummingbird. So at least I got these shots. I included this to make a point about motion. Think about the speed of a hummingbird's wings. They flap or actually they make a, a figure eight movement, um, an average of 50 times per second, much faster than you can see with your eyes. So think about that bed on the feet of the racehorse. They had ever never seen all four feet in the air. Well, without high-speed photography, we would never see the wing of a hummingbird in flight. And a great place to practice capturing motion is near where I live. This is Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area in Pennsylvania, because in late February and early March, tens of thousands of beautiful snow geese stop here. And it's an amazing sight and sound when they all lift up in unison. And close to sunset, they all fly in from the fields and um, roost on the lake for the night. And this is a good example of what your camera can see, but your eye cannot. Kind of like a, a ceiling fan spinning around and you can't see the individual fan blades. These snow geese fly and circle. And when you are there, you experience this amazing motion, but your eye cannot freeze and see the scene like your camera can. And these are tundra swans at Middle Creek. They can be quite graceful when flying overhead. Another fast shutter speed to freeze the action of this street performer. Well, Jim and I were fortunate a few years ago to go on a photography trip to Cuba. And we visited a local dance studio and it was dim in the room, bright light pouring in from the back windows. You can see here, not the best lighting conditions. So in this case, I set my camera, a Sony A6000, some were asking about Sony's, to an automatic preset called sport mode, which basically means I let the camera pick all the settings needed to freeze the action. So it shows a very high ISO of 3200, which can create some noise or a bit of graininess. But for me, I would prefer to have some noise in the image and be able to capture unique dance actions rather than have a perfect quality shot and miss the whole point. We also attended a performance by a Santeria dance troupe. Santeria is an Afro-Cuban religion and the dancers perform this frenzied trance-like dance to drums that was really quite fascinating. At one two hundredth of a second, it was fast enough to freeze most of the action, but you see a bit of a blur on the dress and in the hair. So those examples were all done with natural light, but the burst of a flash is much faster than the shutter speed of your camera. To really capture high-speed movement, it's best to use a flash. So although the shutter speed in this one is one two fiftieth of a second, the motion is frozen by the flash, which is actually faster, as fast as maybe one ten thousandth of a second. 
And these are just done at home by dropping colorful objects into a fish tank. You do need to pre-focus where you think your subject will be as it happens way too fast for any kind of autofocus to work. And here's the setup. And again, I will share a PDF of the slides that include notes such as this. So you do need a fish tank with flat sides, a dark background. Uh, for here I have a, a black blanket behind it. Uh, after I did this setup, we actually painted the backside of our fish tank black. A squeegee, some bubbles will form on the sides. So that's why I have this squeegee here to keep taking, getting rid of those bubbles. And you do need to pre-focus on an object in the middle of the tank. So I've set this hammer in here, little piece of blue tape, set my camera up on a tripod and I focused right here because this is where I think those strawberries will be when we trigger that flash. And then obviously take the uh, hammer out and fill this up with water. Use an off camera flash and have a friend drop fruit or other objects into your fish tank and find someone that doesn't mind getting wet because <laughs> it makes a mess. So and here are some other items I played with. Look around your house, see what you can experiment with or get into the action yourself and don't be afraid to get wet. Again, at 1 60th of a second, you would not freeze those bubbles unless you used a flash. And if you don't have a fish tank or an external flash, you can still create images like these. Um, I picked up a flat-sided clear plexiglass vase at the dollar store and it worked quite well for this. And I just used a strong desk light for some side lighting, some seltzer water, just play around and have fun. Capturing the motion of smoke is fun. Just burn some incense, use a flash. So images can be recorded in a fraction of a second or over much longer periods of time. Fraction of a second, the movement is frozen. Now it is slowed down to 1 15th of a second, introducing some blur, allowing the camera to capture the movement of the birds. So even with wildlife, longer shutter speeds can lead to surprising new images. So experiment with different shutter speeds to make creative photographs. Fast shutter speed, slower shutter speed. And you know, neither one is right or wrong. It just depends on what you want to convey. I love this capture by Jim. It's one of those snow geese at, at Middle Creek. A butterfly's action stopped at 1 250th of a second. But at 1 50th of a second, you can see the movement, somewhat abstract, but fun or slow that shutter down a bit to capture the motion of snow flying into an open window. If I had shot this at 1 500th of a second or faster, the snow would have been captured as tiny specks instead of these streaks, which I think gives more of a feel of motion. Time exposures can allow us to record things that we can't see with the naked eye. The streaks of light that are actually headlights on the left and taillights on the right. Again, that's not the way you see it, but that's the way your camera can see it. And I love trying to capture a mix of static objects and moving objects, people standing motionless while the train speeds by. Quite abstract, but you can still tell this is a train speeding by. And this is a highway and the cars are probably doing 60 miles per hour. So this was a two second exposure to capture those streaks of taillights and headlights. And now I'm in a small downtown and the cars are moving much slower. So this was eight seconds, a lot longer. Now the camera's on a tripod, which is a must when doing an eight second exposure. And this is the same downtown. This is from the, the roof of a public parking lot. And the, the roof actually has this high cement wall around it. So I had to raise the tripod in the air and brace the tripod legs against a wall to get the camera high enough. Uh, to get this shot. I actually had to guess the direction of the camera. So I, I think I got lucky. Wildlife. Well, this is a school of Menhaden fish in Cape Cod and they were moving fast. I just love the spiral pattern that they made. And this is a selfie of my shadow, just gives you an idea of the sense of scale of how many there were. 
a muskrat at a wildlife preserve in Delaware. And not where you would expect to capture wildlife. This is actually at a sculpture garden. And those aren't sculptures, those are real birds. And I was happy to get the reflection on this one. Quite the unlucky fish. I don't know what this bird is. It's some kind of a stork. This was from a wonderful trip we took to Botswana a couple of years ago. And here are a few more from that trip. This one just makes me laugh. And these elephants would dust themselves. First, they would splash themselves with water and then they create their own dust storm. Apparently the, the dust cools them off and it protects their skin against parasites. But I just love the way the uh, sun captured that dust swirling around. Capture of the elephant tossing the water up. A hippo thrashing about while sparring with another hippo. It's pretty scary. And a baby baboon cradled by its mother. So setting up the scene and waiting for something to happen. Like Henri Cartier-Bresson's famous image, it is believed that he would scout out his composition and then just wait to capture that precisely timed meaningful moment. So what we see here is probably uh, the result of the so-called fishing technique. You find a good location and then wait for a suitable subject to enter the frame and complete your composition. So here are a series of images by my husband, Jim, at a reenactment of a Revolutionary War battle. And he was attracted to the repeating patterns of the soldiers' tents. So by moving around, he framed a nice composition of the leading lines through two rows of tents. And every so often, some of the soldiers would walk through the frame. So he just stayed there for a while, hoping to capture someone of interest at just the right moment. And there it is. When this young soldier walked through with the drum on his back, he felt he had something special. And I agree. I had the same idea in Cuba. I was fascinated by the colors and the shapes on the painted wall, the peeling paint on the door. So I just sat on the curb across the street and watched people going by. And this guy with the pink cap, he wasn't going anywhere. So, but then I noticed that the low sun was also creating some dramatic shadows on the wall. And I thought, I wonder if I could get the man with the cap, perhaps showing an interaction with a shadow. And then it happened. It was my finished shot. I think it's graphically pleasing. And I love the story and the expression on this man's face. And another example by Jim at Grand Central Station in New York, bright sunlight was pouring in at a low angle, creating these long shadows. So he positioned himself in the middle of the commotion and waited. He started out by framing the people and then he tilted the camera down. He started to focus less on the people and more on the shadows. And again, just waiting for something interesting. And here it is. This was the decisive moment. The foot on the left and the foot on the right are both lifted off the floor, showing the movement. And the shadow of the little girl holding her father's hand, that captured the moment he was waiting for. So up until now, we have held the camera steady and either frozen motion or allowed motion to move and be captured. Well, let's shake that up a bit. Now we move the camera. Intentional camera movement, or ICM as it is sometimes referred to, it's basically a different branch of photography altogether. The final result produces a blurred, colorful, and abstract image on purpose. So think of it as being like an expressionistic painter. And panning is one of the most popular ICM techniques. It is easy and fun. Using a slower shutter speed, maybe 1 30th, 1 15th of a second, you swipe your camera up and down. You are panning your subject. It's sometimes called swipes. And part of the fun of panning is that you never really know how the image will turn out. It's another example of how our eyes and the camera see things differently. If you look at a bunch of trees with your eyes and you, you move your head up and down, you will likely still see the trees well-defined, but the camera doesn't, it sees a blur. The trees work quite well, as although you can get a dreamy, surreal image, you still recognize the subject. It takes a lot of experimentation and, and do be, pre be prepared to delete a lot of misses. 
This one has a bit of a shake in it, giving it a different sort of staccato, jumpy feel. But it doesn't have to be trees. This effect can work well with flowers. You probably recognize this is tulips. I like to just plop down on the ground and play with this technique because I really like the abstract movement effect. Not recognizable, but very abstract. This is actually a very colorful bunch of autumn leaves. And I like to experiment with other subjects, go beyond nature. There's this old steel factory near us called Steel Stacks, and I love photographing the structures and the colorful rust, the colors, the patterns, the textures, they're just fantastic. But what about a motion blur here? Very abstract, but beautiful. At the Naval Shipyard in Philadelphia, just a small panning blur gives it a ghost-like effect. The ocean, now the panning is horizontal. And a sunset. Now on all of these examples, the camera is moving, but the subject is not. Let's go back to Cuba, a different kind of panning. Now both the subject and the camera are moving. We follow our subject with the camera. And this allows us to get the subject relatively sharp and blur the background. So you try to match the subject's rate of movement and the direction in which it's traveling. And you're, you're basically swiveling your camera along a parallel axis to the moving subject, and you hope to get at least a part of your subject in focus. So these colorful old cars were a distance away from me. So I'm, I'm panning at about this speed. I'm going swipe, swipe. Now it gets really crazy. At the velodrome in Pennsylvania, these cyclists are very close to the camera. So the panning has to take place much faster. Now I'm going like this, I'm going swipe, swipe, swipe. It's really hard. So, and you get some crazy stuff, quite surreal, but I love the effect created by the spinning of the spokes. So if you want to try this, it helps to use um, high speed or burst mode to take multiple images while holding the shutter button down, especially something going fast like cyclists. And of course you need to be on your shutter priority. And I'd say start with maybe 1 30th, maybe 1 15th of a second. You need to adjust it faster or slower. It depends on how fast your subject is moving. It depends how far away you are from your subject and just keep practice following them. It, it takes a lot of practice to get this. And I found it helps if you actually keep following your subject even after the shutter is done, it just helps you to keep your camera steady. And be prepared to take lots of frames of which most will be throwaways. But I enjoy surprises of bizarre kind of, you know, ghostly images like this. And I really like this one. I think it gives a clear impression of speed and a colorful and strong composition. So now let's add a new twist to the intentional camera motion. And by new twist, I mean that literally. Here's a normal picture of colorful autumn tree, but if we twist our zoom lens, you get some wonderful zoom motion. Zoom in or out while the shutter is open. So you need a zoom lens, but what you do while your shutter is open, you're zooming out or zooming in, either way works. And that gives you that really cool effect. So here's one with no motion blur at all, and just with a slight zoom. And I think this just has this beautiful impressionistic look. Lights in a store window, or other things in nature, such as flowers. And after taking a gazillion images of cherry blossoms in Washington, DC, I, I just wanted a different look. So I like the subtle sort of dreamlike feel to this image. I think it goes well with the cherry blossoms. Cityscapes can be fun. Or just a subtle zoom on neon lights for a new look. Or try a rotation blur. So you don't need a zoom lens for this. You just spin your camera gently while the shutter is open, just twisting your entire camera. <laughs> I do this a lot. So <laughs> I didn't even know I took this shot. I'm not sure if this is a zoom or panning or what. I was up on a ladder to get above the sunflowers and I must have pushed the shutter button on the way down, but I think it's kind of fun. 
And a perfect time to practice these motion techniques is coming up now is with holiday lights. So here's the traditional Christmas tree shot, but watch what happens after I have a glass of wine. It's having a bit more fun. Oh, I like that. I think I'll have another. And with some more wine, it is really starting to party. Disco party. <laughs> so, okay. I think this one may have been after maybe a little bit too much wine. It's actually a combination of a zoom and rotating the camera at the same time. Again, a combination of panning, twisting, and a zoom blur, basically a hangover. <laughs> so and these are actually holiday lights on an outdoor tree. I had read an article by Olympus about doing these rotational blurs with Christmas trees, and I decided to try it out. So I put the camera underneath a lit tree and spun the camera. And uh, this is a crop of one of my experiments, very abstract. I like how you can actually see the effect of the pulsating lights. So this was hard to set up and try to get the camera down low on a tripod pointing straight up and loosen the ball head to spin the camera. I, I think if I, uh, it, I'm gonna go to Goodwill see if I can find a, a lazy Susan and try it that way. That might, might be easier, I don't know. But as usual, I wound up with some surprises. It was freezing cold out. I probably hit the shutter with my gloves on and didn't even know it, but I kind of like that. Well, we can't have a conversation about motion photography without talking about water. I think water may be one of the best subjects to experiment with different shutter speeds to get very different results. A fast shutter speed to capture and freeze the motion of water flowing over a sand dollar, or slow down to freeze the subject, but show the blur of the moving tide as the water sweeps back to the ocean. But be sure to hold on to your tripod if you do this. I almost lost a camera on this one. This, those waves started taking my tripod right with them. And this is somewhere in between. At one tenth of a second, the splashes hitting the rocks appear stretched and, and are emphasized. This great blue heron was flying in one direction above the rapids below, going in the other direction. So to freeze the motion, a very high shutter speed was needed. And of course, we have to talk about waterfalls. How do you get that smooth water flow? Some call it a cotton candy look. Do you want to get that look? That's up to you. So here you see detail in the water. You see the crunchiness of it. Same scene with the shutter opened longer with that cotton candy look to the waterfall. Keep in mind, neither approach is right or wrong, whatever you like best. So I'm gonna talk about some waterfalls using different shutter speeds. So I'm gonna start with one 1 thousandth of a second and it's pretty crunchy there, slowed down to 1 15th of a second, just so you start to get the idea that the longer the shutter is open, the smoother the water will be. Now I'm at a full half of a second. But let's get into how shutter speed affects exposure because the more time the shutter is open, the more light comes into your camera. So, up until now, the images that I showed you, because they were set on shutter priority, you told the camera how long you wanted the shutter to be open, but the camera is making other adjustments to make sure that the exposure works. But now I'm gonna show some examples where I've switched to manual mode, which means now I'm in control of all of the camera settings. Here, I started at 1 2 50th of a second, and froze the moving water. So notice sort of the crunchiness in the foreground here. Now at 1 15th of a second, much slower, a blur starts to occur. You can start to see some blur here, um, but it's still fairly sharp in the pool in the center. It's a bit overexposed, but that could be adjusted by lowering the ISO. Now at a full second, notice that swirls are starting to form in the pool and the waterfall and the cascading water in the foreground definitely have a smoother appearance. At two seconds, even more motion is captured, uh, but it's, it's a bit overexposed. Well, my ISO is 200. Let's cut that to 100 and see what happens. Okay, it's the same two seconds, so the look of the motion of the water is the same, but at ISO 100, the exposure looks pretty good. 
So what happens if we go to four seconds to go for that really smooth cotton candy look? Well, now so much light is now coming in that the image is overexposed. Well, I'm already at the lowest ISO that my camera can do. Well, yeah, you could change the f-stop, but for this example, I'll leave that constant. Instead, I will add a neutral density filter on the front of the lens. It's, here's a neutral density filter. It's kind of like putting on sunglasses and that cuts down the light. Yeah, by adding that filter to cut down the light, now the exposure looks much better and I now have that smooth, dreamy look to the water. And here's one more at six seconds. Again, this may be way too much smoothing out of the water for you. That's up to you as an artist. And a few more waterfalls. So to be sure the surrounding landscape is in focus during a long exposure, a tripod of course is essential. And I can now check this one off my bucket list, a spectacular, very popular waterfall in Oregon. And one of the largest waterfalls in Iceland, this has a drop of almost 200 feet and you can walk right up to the base of it. Uh, you get wet, but it's worth it. And I'd love uh, this lone figure dwarfed by the power of nature. And maybe some of you have been to Thunder Hole in Acadia in Maine. The waves rush into a small cavern and the water is forced out with this thunderous roar, hence the name. Uh, this isn't a very safe spot for this man to be standing. About 10 years ago, three people were on these rocks and a rogue wave came up and washed them out to sea. It's a very powerful force of water. Very different image of water, flowing and serene. This was of the swells created off the back of a powerboat. The beautiful fountains at Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania. And they don't allow tripods during the fountain show. So this is handheld. And I was pretty far away. As you can see, this has a high ISO of 16,000 creating some noise, but it doesn't bother me. And we don't always have perfect weather conditions. Sounds like you're getting a bit of this out where you are. While photographing at a state park, uh, Jim and I took cover in our car just before a, a huge storm blew through. So we're trapped in the car. What do I do when I'm trapped in the car? I take shots through the windshield of the pouring rain at varying shutter speeds. That's how I learn. And when the rain let up, I captured this graceful flow of water. And this is a technique I'm still working on, water splash. Now this was done outdoors and I did not have a tripod. So I actually set the camera on the ground to keep it steady. So. I was pleased without a flash to be able to capture this. Really to try to do a shot like this, you should use a flash. So this one may be a bit difficult to figure out. You get a sense of water flowing, but the image is a bit abstract. Is that some kind of a rabbit from Mars swimming through rapids? Well, actually it's simulated motion is in reality, nothing is moving it might start to make sense in its original vertical orientation. It's a macro image of an icicle. And some more water. Jim and I do all sorts of wacky photo experiments. We wanted to capture wine splashing up the side of a wine glass. So you may have seen this on some wine labels, you know, like, like the expensive wine that I buy that comes in the big cardboard box. So Jim built this ramp and put a wooden stop at the bottom down here. So when these wine glasses slid down, they're supposed to hit this and uh, causing the liquid to flow up and out of the side of the glass. Well, this took a lot of practice. Um, you know, we're getting closer. Yeah, that's pretty much what we're looking for. So we added some food coloring. Oops, we had a casualty. And now we're getting some splashes, uh, some other random splashes and finally got a decent one. So we cropped in tighter for the finished image and, and gave it a high key look. So in a great way to capture motion using water is with reflections. Maybe nothing is moving, but it certainly looks like it is. Another reflection. This gives the feel of a panning motion blur, but it's just the distortion from the slight movement of the water. I think it's quite impressionistic. This one's quite abstract, the reflection of a wind jammer in Maine. 
So I do wanna describe a bit more about neutral density filters as they can make quite a difference. The ocean in Acadia hitting the rocks. And again, you can see sort of the crunchy detail of the water at one, one twenty-fifth of a second. But maybe you wanna go for a different look, kind of smooth out that water a bit. But going to a full six seconds on a bright sunny day, it would look something like this. Way too much light is coming into your camera and you can't adjust any settings to get a good exposure when your shutter is letting in bright sunlight for a full six seconds. So you gotta put those sunglasses on the front of your lens, add a neutral density filter or more than one. They, they come in all different um, heavinesses or darknesses, I should say, and you can actually stack them to make it darker. Clouds take on a mysterious feel when stretched out by using a neutral density filter and a long exposure. So on all these, I'm using the same f-stop and same ISO. The only thing changes, only the time is changing, but I have to add neutral density filters. So you can see on this second one, eight seconds, the clouds are already stretched out. Now I'm up to a full 30 seconds. Those clouds are really stretched out, but I have to add more stops of neutral density. Now I'm up to a full 12 stops of neutral density. Because think 30 seconds, how much light would be coming into your camera for 30 seconds? You really have to cut down that light a lot. And this is actually the exact same image, just converted to black and white, because I really like clouds like this in monochrome. Here's a beautiful sunset of the Philadelphia skyline. And I like these clouds, but they take on a whole different look when stretched out over three minutes. And again, I really like black and white with this look. Some stars, well, I haven't done a lot of night sky photography, but just wanted to point out the challenges with the motion of the stars, or actually, of course, it's the motion of the earth. You need to keep your shutter open long enough for enough light to reach your sensor. But if you leave it open too long, your stars turn into little streaks. So this was a 30 second exposure. I lit my daughter with a flashlight while the camera was on a tripod. I just walked up to her and kind of lit her with some light. Another Milky Way shot, but I thought this was kind of fun as it picked up a satellite moving through the night sky. And I know you've all seen images of star trails much better than this one, but I finally did my first attempt last winter. It was bitter cold, windy night. I'm out in a farmer's field in Lancaster County in Pennsylvania to find a dark sky area. I set up the camera and I used something called an intervalometer to time the images. So at least I didn't have to freeze my fingers by pushing the shutter every 30 seconds over a period of 40 minutes. So for those of you who don't know how this is done, multiple images are shot and then blended together as layers in Photoshop. Okay, we're done with water and stars, something different. So how would you go about capturing the motion of tiny dandelion seeds flying off flower heads? Scanning. The camera is a flatbed scanner. This is just a scanner we bought to scan documents, a Canon Cano scan, nothing fancy. And the image on the left shows how Tomatoes and onions were placed on the scanner, and here's the resulting image on the right. So the scanner, it actually takes the picture from below, okay? That's why from below, it's all upside down. But not only upside down, everything is backwards. Here you see I've placed the, the big red onion on the bottom left and top right, and the image, it's reversed. It's on the bottom right and top left. So this is what an arrangement looks like as it is placed on the scanner. It looks like quite a mess, doesn't it? Here is the scan from that mess. So I wanna point out this big mayapple here and a smaller mayapple here. Here it is, the big mayapple and the smaller one. And they're covered with this sprig of azalea. Here's that sprig of azalea. So hopefully you get an idea of, of what's going on. And I know some of you may remember a few of these scanning images from the presentation I did a year ago on still lifes. But this is how I use it to simulate motion. This is jewelweed. And as a child, I loved, I loved trying to gently grab these little seed pods and then letting them pop open in my hand because it, it makes these springs that shoot the seeds out. So I just laid the pieces on the scanner to make it look like an exploding plant. 
lettuce, tomatoes, and peppers, gently falling to create a beautiful salad. You can simulate the magic of milkweed seed pods floating away. I don't know how you could capture this out in a field. You'd have all sorts of crap behind it and to get those seed pods in focus, it would be pretty tough. So, okay, let me take a pause here. We're about halfway through and ask if there are any questions or any comments. Jan, you have anything? Um, I have a couple that have come in on the chat. One is, um, have you used a gimbal to hold the camera? Um, no. So you don't have a gimbal head, but you do have a, it's a- I have a, I have a ball, head. ball head. I have a ball head. Um, I'm not sure what kind it is, but I don't believe it's a gimbal. He might've been asking with regard to when you were doing the, um, um, when you were moving the camera for the pans. Uh, well, for the pans, for the panning, it's all handheld. If you're just okay. talking about those trees and those pans, that's handheld. He may have been asking when I had it underneath that tree and I was trying to swivel it around underneath a tree and maybe a gimbal ball head is what I needed. I don't, I really struggled with, with the, the ball head that I had trying to swivel the camera. So there could be better equipment. So when you were doing the pans, um, none of those were done on a tripod. They were all handheld. They're all handheld, yes. Um, you could do it on a tripod. And um, it, it might help doing it on a tripod to keep your camera sort of steady. Okay. Um, you know, you'd have to have your tripod loose enough so that your camera obviously could go up and down. Right. Um, but I, I do mine handheld. Okay. Um, another question was, I've, uh, this is, I think, more of a comment. I've set my camera on top of the kitchen timer and taken long exposures, okay? Um, and then um, Shay asked, which neutral density filters do you often use? I have some of the Lee filters and I'm looking for some to add to my collection. All right, I use, um, it's called B&W filter. I don't know, that's what it says on the, on the, on the box here. It says B&W filter. And what, what, uh, how many stops do you have? Do you, is I it have, a variable or? I know I don't have a variable, um, which is referring to a variable you can get that I guess you twist it or something and it gets darker. Um, I have three of them. I, this one is a two stop and you can actually kind of see through it. I also have a six stop that's darker. You can barely see through it. And I have a 10 stop. You can't see through it at all. It's so dark. Um, and then you can stack them. So I can put the two and the six together and that gives me eight stops of neutral density. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, somebody just said, he commented handheld gimbal. I think this was the same person who asked about if you um, have used the gimbal. So okay. those are the only questions in the, um, in the chat, but if someone has a question, you can unmute yourself and ask the question and then um, please mute yourself again when you're done asking the question, so. Have you experimented at all using a polarizing filter? Yes, I do use a polarizing filter quite a bit. Um, probably some of those waterfall shots that I had, um, I used a polarizing filter. And I will also use, because that does cut down the light. And I'll also use a polarizing filter sometimes on um, even like wet leaves and things like that, it cuts down the glare. So I would absolutely recommend a polarizing filter. Can you use it in substitute for neutral density? I mean, if you don't have a neutral density with you, I guess it's better than nothing. Yes, if you're trying to slow the motion of a waterfall, um, a lot of times you can use a neutral density filter, especially a lot of waterfalls are sometimes- You mean polarizing. In, uh, polarizing filter, yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, a lot of waterfalls are in, you know, dark areas. Areas. areas, they're in dark areas. So it's already somewhat dark and the polarizer can just cut down enough light so that you can have a longer exposure. Anyone else have a question? Yes. How do you, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you get the uh, black background on the scanning images? Okay. I just wondered if someone would ask that. The other question they ask is if the lid is up or down, same kind of thing. Um, 
the the light is very powerful and it falls off very quickly the light from the, the scanner you know if you operate a scanner you see this bright light kind of go, come across your object it falls off very very quickly and it falls off to blackness and i do this the lid is always up because the objects on the scanner have you know height to them i can't close the lid and i do this in a room in the daytime with the windows open i don't have a bright light right over the scanner that would cause a light to to be on there but the light falls off so quickly it turns to blackness very quickly um someone asked what scanner do you use i have a canon cano scan i think the model is 8600 it's really a cheap scanner. I think it was like 120 bucks. Um, you know, just these flatbed scanners that you get for home office to scan documents. And, and you know, it's <laughs> nothing special. But they also do very, very high resolution. And you can get incredible detail. It's, it's fun to play with. Yeah, a question I had was, uh, do you know the DPI on that scanner? Uh, the DPI goes up to, I think, 4,800. I don't scan at 4,800 because it takes way too long and the files are huge. I usually scan at about 1,200 DPI. Are you scanning as JPEG? Uh, I believe it's either TIFF or JPEG. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Let's move on. Rear curtain sync. So when shooting with flash and using a slow shutter speed, you can record, a, um, record movement and freeze it at the same time. So here I held up four golf balls. Jim opened the shutter. I dropped the golf balls. They bounced down, back up. They suspended for a moment up here, which is why they're somewhat in focus. And then they're coming back down, flash. You can see where Jim triggered the flash so that something is, is there to freeze them. So, and here I did a selfie with a 10 second delay on a timer so I could run around and get in front of the camera. So there is a setting on most cameras called rear curtain sync. And what it means is when your shutter opens, a, a, uh, a curtain goes up. And at the end of your exposure, the second curtain closes and then everything goes back down and resets. So curtain opens and depending how long an exposure you have, this stays open and then the second curtain closes. Well, the, this is a setting where the flash will go off right before the second curtain closes. Hopefully that makes some sense. So was the first image that you showed just a minute ago, was that um, first, was that with the first curtain or with the second curtain? Um, the curtain opened and during that, while it's open, the golf balls dropped down, up and came back down right before the second curtain closed, flash. Okay, so the fl it, this is a second curtain flash. Yes. Okay. Your curtain or second curtain flash. Sometimes it's called second curtain flash. Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay, so then I experimented with some light sticks, probably some wine, while Jim tries to ignore me in the next room. <laughs> I'm just flying around. Uh, I like this one. I think it looks like my hair flew off. So, and we had a mottled gray background set up, which is why you see sort of a smoky textured look behind me. Um, and, you know, I, I like this look but it's not quite what I was trying to achieve. So I asked for a black background for my birthday and I got it because this is the look I wanted to create with that black background. Now, this is a little bit more complex of a setup. Uh, Jim has some lighting set up on the right side. He's got a continuous light in a soft box that will diffuse and spread the light. So that's providing the light as I move, as I jump around like an idiot through the frame. And then on the left, he has a speed light that fires again at the end of the exposure, right before that second curtain closes, and that freezes the action. So again, blurred motion, frozen motion. So the blurred motion comes from the continuous light? Yes, that's correct. And exactly. The, and the 
freeze it comes at the end comes at the end from a flash. The actual okay it comes from a flash you know okay. and the way the camera is set up if you set your camera to rear curtain sync it the camera will flash right at the end of the exposure uh, were these done with your mirrorless or or before mirrorless uh this is all with my mirrorless okay and here's another from the same photo shoot actually some of the, these may be uh no, i think this is jim's fuji i mean jim took these but this is a mirrorless as well i may have some examples later that um are from uh, a canon so, but this is another one from the same photo shoot. Jim says, I look like an angel. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> okay. LAPP or light art performance photography is not only a mouthful, it's a style in which you literally paint your pictures with light. Now this is fun. And the crazy part is it's created with only one picture, no Photoshop skills needed. You just grab a light and experiment. So if I was in the room with you all, I would ask you to guess how I did this. Some of you probably can. We attached a string of LED lights to a canoe paddle. And this is the motion of the paddle as Jim paddles in the dark and I take a 30 second shot. And this is the same thing. And some of you have probably done this fire spinning. So it's done by swinging steel wool that's been set on fire. So our camera club hosted a workshop and we did do this in a safe location at a firefighter training location, emergency professionals nearby, but it was fun. So with a slow shutter speed of 10 seconds, you capture a rain of sparks flying down. It stretches them out. So of course we did something similar at home. So now Jim has me holding a grinder on a piece of sheet metal to create flying sparks. I'm safe again. I've got on safety glasses and an apron and uh, a hat and everything. So it was safe. But this is actually another example of the rear curtain sink, as it is a long exposure of a half a second to show the spray of those flying sparks and then the flash to light me at the end of the exposure. And the next thing I know, Jim asked me to dress in black and he's wrapping me up with colorful string lights. You know, I'm thinking now what is he trying to do? Well, this is what he's trying to do. He had me run through the frame when it was dark enough. So again, this is a combination of light painting or that LAPP and rear curtain sink as the flash was burst at the end to freeze the image of me. Without that flash, you wouldn't have seen my face at all. You would have just seen the patterns of the, the lights of the string lights that were wrapped around me. <laughs> so this one usually stumps people. How is this done? Well, we have a friend, Charles, who loves playing with all sorts of toys to create light motion. And he did a workshop for our club. So you can see here, this is a bicycle tire with lights placed around the rim. And here you can see it in the dark and get an idea of how it spins on the floor. Four seconds for it to go around in one rotation. And this is Charles, he's just walking through the frame in the dark. He's like sort of swinging that bicycle wheel around. Here's Charles holding his lightsaber. He's got a lot of toys. <laughs> and this image gives you an idea of what's going on, but this is what it looks like in the dark. And here he is swinging it around him and you can see his silhouette in the middle. I've got a little added bonus. I like the little exit sign on the, <laughs> in the corner there. <laughs> And this is my husband, Jim. Isn't he a good sport? So for this one, our friend Charles is actually walking around Jim waving a red flashlight wand. So my camera was on bulb mode, meaning that the shutter was opened with a remote cable and left open until Charles was finished painting with light. And when he said stop, the remote button was pushed again to end the exposure. So that's why you see that strange 53 seconds. It's he said, start, open your shutter. And when he's done waving this flashlight around, close, close the shutter. And something new I learned while doing research for this presentation, physiograms, they create some very nice abstract light painting images. It's similar to those um, when you were a kid, you may have had a spirograph. 
Well, these are easy, cheap to create, so give it a try. And here's how you do it. Um, 30 seconds or longer, preset, you need to pre-focus and set to manual focus. And you swing a small light from something up high. I did it from a ceiling fan. You turn the ceiling fan off, that doesn't make the motion. What makes the motion is the flashlight hanging from a string. You sort of push it in a circle. So it makes sort of a pendulum motion. And then your camera is on the floor and uh, obviously the lights are out. Be sure your flashlight doesn't fall on your camera. But you get some fun sort of otherworldly graphic images. So now let's go to long exposure and multiple flashes. Now we paint with bursts of light. This is a single frame of just two dancers. A tripod is a must. You set it up and pre-focus. Turn out all the lights. Open the shutter for eight seconds. A burst of flash from a speed light was manually triggered four times. So as the dancers moved across the floor, flash, 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 close your shutter. This is also eight seconds. The flash was shot five times. This was done at that workshop by our friend Charles, of course. But Jim and I had to try this one at home. So this was done with a Canon speed light um, set in multi-mode, which means it was preset to fire five bursts per second for three seconds. And this is sort of a, a surreal image, but this is what it started out like. And we made many attempts at this and most were just a confusing jumble. So I, I put this in to let you know that this isn't always easy. Um, it's kind of hard to tell what the heck you're looking at here but I rather like the jumble of hands down here. So I took Jim's picture and just cropped in on it. So this one worked a bit better. We lowered the number of flash bursts from 15 down to nine, and now it's a bit less jumbled. I think I'm about to punch myself in the face. Now, pixel stick. Jim was awarded this toy. Um, be before you go on to that, yep. can, can somebody asks, do you use TTL flash for rear curtain sync? Through the lens for rear curtain sync. Um, I don't know. Jim is the one who did the setups on those. He's my technical expert. Oh, here he comes, the technical expert. Do I use TTL? Sometimes I use TTL, sometimes manual. Sometimes TTL, sometimes manual. <laughs> okay. The, the, ones and... I did, the ones I did of myself, by the way, um, there was no, there was no setting for that. It was just the on-camera flash. Okay. So you and, don't have to have fancy equipment to do it. Um, and another question here is, um, do you use fast flash like over, over your, um, your, uh, native, each camera has a native, uh, flash sync speed. Um, but, but some, um, some flashes allow you to, to set a high speed flash. Okay, my expert is saying no. <laughs> That's something you don't use. No, no, no. no. we're not as fancy as, I guess okay. we don't have the fancy equipment that your guy does. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, um, pixel stick. Well, Jim was awarded this toy at one of our camera club celebrations and they're actually 200 tiny LED lights that go along the edge of the stick. And the pixel stick comes with a dozen built-in patterns, different colors, rainbow patterns. And if you wave the stick about a bit while walking, it creates these really, really cool patterns. So this is that pre-programmed rainbow pattern. And you can create some fun stuff like this. Here, Jim asked me to hold the pixel stick close to the ground and walk on a trail that goes through our woods behind our house. So let's add a person to the shot. We asked our friend to pose as still as possible while we walked behind her with the pixel stick so she appears in silhouette. Now, we're back to that rear curtain flash again. Now we've used that technique with the pixel stick. So you can actually see me, <laughs> I'm over here as I'm finishing up walking the pixel stick behind Jim. Um, and at the end of the exposure, we've added a flash. So Jim has been lit up and frozen as the flash 
burst was very fast. If we hadn't put a flash on him, he would have been in silhouette, just like the shot before. And this is the same thing. This time I am the subject. But here's where it gets really crazy. You can load your own image into the pixel stick. So each one of its 200 LEDs acts like a pixel on a screen, displaying your image one vertical line at a time as you walk. So we're here we have our friend Bob set up like he's raising a glass to himself. Well, we already had this picture of Bob and downloaded it onto the pixel stick. Then we just asked Bob to sit in the dark, hold up his beer bottle and sit still. He had no idea what we were doing. That other image of Bob is now in the pixel stick. And as Jim walks by, slices of the photo flash, all you see is this weird stick blinking. It almost looks a little bit like this as he walks by and Bob just sat still. And then when Jim was done walking with the stick, we lit Bob with a burst of flash. Alas, the end result is real Bob and virtual Bob together. This is a single frame. It is not Photoshopped. For this one, I'm actually sitting in a canoe that they put up on a picnic table. <laughs> Jim builds and restores wooden canoes, and this is one that he built. So an image of the ocean was loaded onto the pixel stick, and then Jim walked by twice, once with the ocean image on the stick behind me, and then again with it in front of me. So I I'm a little confused, and I, I suspect <laughs> others are too. Okay. When the image is actually being taken, you don't actually see the completed, like in this case, what you have up here, the, the waves. You the don't waves. see that. No. All you see when the person, I'm sitting on the picnic table in the dark, I'm sitting very still. All I see is I know someone's walking by me with the stick and the stick is literally blinking. It's, it's almost going do, like this. Do they actually have to walk? Or yes. Do they, or can they... Or, well, if they didn't walk, this this whole ocean would would be right here. Uh, you have to walk. You have to walk, and and if you walk fast, the ocean compresses. If you walk slowly, the ocean stretches out because your image is flashing. One, it's like you take your image and you slice it, and your image is coming back one slice at a time. So you mm -hmm. kind of have to practice the timing too on this because like I say, if you, if you walk too slow, um, like this next one, okay, here's one with Jim's head. Um, we did this a bunch of times because first he walked it behind me and if he walked too slow, his head got really skinny. If he walks too slowly, his head gets really wide. <laughs> so you kind of have to practice it. And you can, you can actually see you know, some striations here uh, and, and some lines you can, so you can almost get the idea of the pixels, but it's one slice of the photo going up and down on that pixel, on that pixel stick at a time. So for those, I, for those who might be interested, they're in the chat. A couple of um, members have um, put in um, information about how to use a, a pixel stick and maybe where you can get one so okay yeah they're not cheap i know that maybe someone in the chat knows how much it is but um yeah so for this one jim had loaded a creepy picture of himself and walked it behind me and he just told me to look scared i had no idea what was on the stick so yeah we have a lot of fun with our friends with this um especially because they'll have their cameras set up and they have no idea what they're taking a picture of and then when we're done and the, the image pops up on, you know, on the little screen on your camera, they go, <gasps> you can put all sorts of fun things in there. So it's a lot of fun. So let's talk about maybe you are the motion. So you've seen examples like this where the photographer and camera are stationary and the subject has movement. Like here you see these ghost-like images of people as they move on the escalator. Well, what happens if the photographer is moving on the escalator? Both the photographer and camera are moving through something that is stationary. So the escalator steps are sharp as the camera and the steps are moving together. But the sides of the escalator show the motion as the camera moves up and the sides do not. 
Now I had to try this one about 20 times as I was paddling solo and I had to paddle really hard to get the canoe moving through these grasses. And then I had to lay back low to get the shot because I needed to have the front of the canoe in the shot. This is that same canoe that Jim built, by the way. Um, but you get the idea. The canoe is sharp as the camera is moving with the canoe, while the grasses in the water appear to glide by. In reality, the canoe is moving and the grasses are not. Okay, so now we're gonna take it up one more level. What if you are in a car going 25 miles per hour while you pan a subject? As the car goes by, you rotate the camera to keep the subject in the frame. You do need two people to do this. You need a driver and the photographer. And you get this swirly, crazy rotation effect. Okay, I'm gonna try to demonstrate for you here on the little zoom screen. But so I don't know if you can see the back of my, you might not even be able to see the back of my chair. Here's the back of my chair. Just pretend that's the tree. And the road is going along behind the tree. So as the car approaches the tree, I've got my camera pointed towards the tree. As the car goes by, I keep my camera pointed towards the tree. So you can see the rotational effect happening there. So that's the world. So it's a combination of lateral movement and a rotational movement. So you've got a lot of movement going on here. So are you actually moving the camera or just you're just pointing it out and the the fact that you're going past the object. Um, I'm, I'm rotating the camera. So I'm, yeah, as we move by, I need to keep focusing on that subject. So yeah, I have to swivel. I'm, okay. I guess you'd say I'm swiveling. Okay. And it does work great with colorful trees, such as dogwoods. This is a redbud tree in spring, colorful trees in autumn. So I was glad, Jan, to hear you say you still have some color out there. If people want to try this, autumn trees are perfect for it. Of course, that rain's going to take it all down tonight, isn't it? <laughs> um, but you can focus on other subjects. This is a cabin in Valley Forge. I live close to Valley Forge. But you can, you know, you can actually see the rotation effect on that grass down there. Corn stalks while passing a farm. Kind of looks like ghosts are leaving the cemetery. And sometimes it just, it results in like a hurricane of texture and color. And I just love this type of photography. It makes me feel the excitement of connecting with the forest as I move through it. And uh, they tend to be quite abstract. Impressions of color, texture, in which the details are actually dissolved by the motion. But in most images, there's enough form retained to suggest a sense of subject. So when here are the how-tos. Um, it's done from a moving car. You do need two people. Don't try this on your own. You're driving past your subject while rotating or swiveling, maybe a better word, your camera to stay focused on your subject. About 25 miles per hour probably works best, but I've done this from a highway going 50, 60 miles per hour, it's just harder. About 1 15th of a second works best for me. It does take a lot of practice. You get a lot, a lot of throwaways. Seriously, I may take a hundred of these before I get one that I like. So let's get creative. Up until now, all of the images with the exception of those star trails image can be done in camera, no Photoshop necessary. So let's look at ways to create or simulate motion using post-processing tools. So this looks like a zoom blur, but it was actually a fully focused sunflower. The radial blur was added in Photoshop, and I'm not going to get into the how-to specifics of Photoshop, because that would be a whole other presentation. I just want to share a few ideas of how you can use post-processing to simulate motion. I wanted to capture fireflies and create sort of a magical fairyland look. So I took about 20 shots, each one six seconds to capture the movement of the lightning bugs. And then it's actually quite easy to blend them together as layers in Photoshop. Here I started with a normal shot of birch trees. And in this case, I added the blur in Photoshop. 
So this is different than the panning blurs we did before because I wanted to add back some of the bark texture. Okay, so here you see a little bit of texture on the bark. I'm gonna go back and forth a couple times without the texture. It's easy, it's just by uh, bringing both layers, um, both images into Photoshop as layers, and then just brushing a bit of texture from one image to the other. So back to setting up the scene and waiting for something to happen, but this time I'll give it a little Photoshop help. I'm in Chelsea Market in New York City, and there's this stretch of flooring that is lit from below. And I just loved watching a variety of legs and shoes, and I felt there had to be a shot. So I just sat on a bench and I took lots and lots of shots. And back at home on the computer, I like this one of the wheelchair and this one with the colorful shoes. And I wondered what would happen if I combined the two. So this is my finished image. And this represents the hustle and the bustle and the diversity that I was experiencing at the time. And I didn't even realize until about a month later that the uh, colorful shoes moving into the frame, that's actually the same, same feet walking out of the frame here, but it doesn't bother me. I still like the shot. So remember this one done in camera using the long exposure and rear curtain sink. Well, this motion blur was all done in post-processing just by adding a blur filter in Photoshop. And I love the solitude of this lonely figure walking on a shallow beach in Cape Cod. But here is the original image, not a great photo, dust spots at all, but I liked the mood and I, it's what I felt when I was there. So I, I decided to try to give it a little help in Photoshop. I used the motion blur filter to smooth out those waves and I enhanced the color to create this serene scene because this is how I remember the magic of those endless patterns of these shallow waves. And a fun trick you can use on seascapes. In this one, I used a fast shutter speed to capture the crashing surf. And this one, I used that neutral density filter to show the soft, more romantic look of the ocean. But then I wanted to add the excitement of the waves. I can combine the two images and just brush in the waves and the spray from the other image. A couple of images captured of skateboarders at a park in Philadelphia. I like the shadow in this one. And this one caught in midair. Second later, he was on the ground. Yeah. And these were done, of course, with a fast shutter speed. But I wondered if I could simulate the motion of using multiple images, similar to what Thomas Eakins did way back in 1885. So I stood in one place and put my camera on burst mode. 13 images blended together in Photoshop. And I did the same with the snow geese at Middle Creek. This is about 30 separate exposures of images taken in burst mode and then combined in Photoshop. So as opposed to just freezing birds in flight, I think it gives the impression of movement. You can see the flight patterns as they move across the sky. And this one has more of a painterly look to it. And you can actually see the movement of the winter vegetation in the foreground as it sways in the breeze. This effect was created by blending multiple images together. And I wanna share my thought process on a shot. Jim is in charge of workshops for our camera club and he loves ballet. So he set up a photo workshop with the local ballet school, the Brandywine Ballet. They provided the dancers in their studio and we had camera club members bring in studio lights. And it was a lot of fun. The dancers were amazing and I think Everyone came away with shots they were happy with, and I got quite a few as well. But in addition to shots like this one, I wanted to try something unique. I wanted a shot that no one else in the group that day would have. Keep in mind, there were 25 of us in the same room, shooting the same dancer with the same light, the same pose. So again, I wanted something different. I wanted this. So remember the story of Ansel Adams and visualization? the combination of imagination and technique, I wanted to show a progression of movements. So how did I do this one? Well, most of the images were shot with a very fast shutter speed. That's why we brought in all the high powered lights. 
But you can see here, uh, this image was shot to freeze the amazing Amanda at the height of a leap. Note the high ISO, one one thousandth of a second. Now look what happens when we go with a much longer shutter speed, one third of a second. And now there is blur that indicates movement. It's a pretty bad shot. I don't want a two-faced Amanda, but I wanted to show that you need to take a lot to get a few that you like. So again, I, I pre-visualize the shot and while everyone else was using a fast shutter speed, I did a series of images with a slow shutter speed because I visualized um, my, my finished image. So here are the shots I used straight out of camera. One, two, three, four. And uh, in this last one, I wanted her to face the opposite direction. So I turned it around and put them all together in Photoshop for the finished image and a different technique to show motion. I took multiple images in succession and brought them in as layers in Photoshop. So by lowering the opacity of some of the images, there's just a subtle sense of graceful movement. And this was done the same way. And sometimes I just like to experiment. I wondered what would happen if I put Amanda, the ballet dancer inside of one of my swirly hurricanes. <laughs> I think she's off to Oz. <laughs> and this was just a couple of weeks ago. We drove by these giant wind turbines and I thought I would try the same technique here. So here's 20 images combined in Photoshop for kind of a fun look of the turbines. So the last series I will share, uh, show some examples of images that began in my imagination. And um, then I had to figure out how to create it. So this one was a bit difficult. The model was not very cooperative. You may remember this from my still life presentation. My dog Shadow did not want to sit still. So it presented a different kind of motion challenge, how to make it stop. And this took a couple of assistants, Jim and our daughter, Alex, a lot of flour, a lot of tries. And Jim realized if you put a little bit of peanut butter right there, that did the trick. Uh, this is the shot I used of our dog Shadow and then had Jim toss some flour around, removed Jim's hand, added the flying flour for the motion, shadow the chef. So this is not the finished shot nor the final model. So now I want to set up a dramatic <laughs> shot. Someone's still unmuted, I think, probably someone who asked a question before getting a little background noise. But now I want to set up a dramatic shot and recreate Lizzie Borden. Have you heard of her? Lizzie Borden took an ax and gave her mother 40 wax. Well, so I started by setting up the lighting and camera angle. So Jim set up side lighting to create that scary look. And I actually have the camera lying on the floor. You can see I'm triggering the remote control in my hand. And now I bring in the real daughter, the real model, our daughter, Alex. And I try to get her to look menacing. She kept cracking up. And we, we took quite a few shots. So here I'm holding a fan to get her hair to fly up. First, I tried a hair dryer. It wasn't powerful enough. So I held up an electric fan and that really put some motion in her hair. Uh, we're making adjustments to the lighting. We had some problems as the ax kept casting a shadow across the side of her face. So Jim's moving the lighting, Alex is changing her pose. And okay, it's getting there. Uh, and with some editing, here's my finished image. Lizzie Borden makes me shudder. And this is our other daughter, Kelsey. She looks a bit nicer, don't you think? <laughs> She's not about to kill her mother with an ax. <laughs> While stuck at home, we've been watching photography videos and practicing lighting. Jim is much better at lighting than I am, as you all know by now. <laughs> and he set up this softbox light above Kelsey. The softbox just gives this beautiful light. So for Kelsey, I didn't even use a fan. I brought in the leaf blower and <laughs> Jim uh, put a couple of colored gels on the light. So we were just experimenting. And I asked Kelsey to pose with a lantern like she was afraid and running away. She plays this virtual game with friends called Pathfinders that includes dragons. So I envisioned a composite of her running through the forest being chased by a dragon. So then I photographed her Pathfinder dragon. Went into my archives, found an image of the Redwood Forest in Oregon. 
added a blue tone in Photoshop and blended them together. Now I just need to add the dragon and I hate it. <laughs> I think it just looks stupid. So, you know, not everything goes according to plan. So I scrapped the dragon, but I still like the image. And I thought, well, maybe I'll change the crop, add some light in that lantern and change the glow on her face to match the lantern light. And here's my finished image into the woods. And you can use your imagination as to what she is running from. Okay, two more examples, and we'll wrap this up. So our camera club does a fun summer challenge. And a few years ago, the theme was song titles, and we were assigned 10 different song titles to illustrate with our photography. So you may know the song, I Set Fire to the Rain by Adele. Well, I immediately visualized the image I wanted to create. I wanted it to rain water and rain fire on me. So I started with a shot of me in one of our canoes. Jim also built this one. I cropped in, I will use this in the shot. And then I used the fire from that fire spinning workshop. And I'll use some of these sparks in the final image. And then I needed rain. I asked Jim to hold up the hose at the garden and I practiced with different sh shutter speeds, relatively fast, a bit slower. I added some clarity, now I had my rain. So next I composited the rain, the sparks, and the image of me. So you can see up here how I brought the, the sparks and the rain in on an angle, the, the angle I wanted to hit the umbrella. And now all I need to do is just add some sparks on the top of the umbrella. And here's my finished image. I set fire to the rain. So these summer challenges are a lot of fun. They force us to think outside the box and get creative. And I have done some wacky and embarrassing stuff. So you may know the song, it's all about that bass, about Megan Trainer. Well, if you do, you know it's actually all about one's derriere. So an image popped into my mind. There was a rather famous image making its rounds on the internet of Kim Kardashian with her rather shapely butt. So yeah, I have no shame. <laughs> I'm going to try to replicate this shot of Kim Kardashian. I did this when Jim went out as I was too embarrassed to even let him know what I was doing. You can see I'm holding the remote and I'm trying different poses and I bring in the props and this is the one I went with. Remember those wine glasses with the splashing wine? Well, here they are again. So here's my finished image. Yeah, it's pretty clear. I ain't no size two, but I can shake it, shake it like I'm supposed to do because you know, I'm all about that base. So yeah, we've all gone a bit stir crazy while stuck at home, but there are so many photo techniques you can learn and try out at home. You don't need to travel, just experiment, try something new and have fun. And I have had fun giving this presentation to you and I thank you. And here's my uh, contact information. Um, again, I will share a PDF of many of the slides, not all of them, but quite a few of them and any of the ones that have the how-to comments on them. So I am very happy to open it up for questions or comments. Oh, Jan, you're muted. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, and most most of what's in the chat are um, comments saying great presentation, thank you, and so forth. Um, Jason said he loves peanut butter. <laughs> so um, if any of you have a, a question, you can unmute yourself and um, ask ask away. I do Betsy, hope that. I, go ahead, Betsy. This is a terrific presentation. Absolutely terrific. Oh, thank you. Also overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Do you have any any suggestions for any of us that have some training in some of this stuff, and it's also been forgotten because I haven't used it recently? Yeah, I get that. <laughs> and how can we proceed? Are there are there sources, book sources, video sources that would help? Yes, to all of the above. Um, you know, I am fortunate that um, 
my my husband Jim also shares the passion for photography. So we do a lot of this stuff together and we kind of motivate each other and that that does help. But a lot of these uh, these things I I get motivated by images that I see online. I will look at all sorts of image boards. Pinterest is a place. Um, you know, if you want to look, you could just type in like motion photography in Pinterest or rear curtain sync in Pinterest, and you'll start to see all these examples. And some of those examples lead you to a website where they explain it. Um, some lead you to videos. And a lot of times also, oh, you know what else we do? We watch a lot of videos on YouTube. Um, BNH has a series of videos. Um, there are quite a few camera manufacturers that have videos and you can just, you know, go to YouTube and type in rear curtain sync or multi-flash photography and you'll start to get all of these videos. So a lot of times um, we'll watch videos and then try to recreate it. So we do a lot of this. So, you know, I think part of my best advice is to just do it. Make a lot of mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes, but we take a lot of photos and eventually you start to get it. And if you keep doing it, you remember it. <laughs> I have to do something three times before I remember it. <laughs> Your work seems to be related to, to rocket chemistry. So uh, our, our space, chem space uh, chemistry, I, I'm, I'm interested. What do you and your husband do in your regular jobs? <laughs> well, we're both retired at this point. And it's, it's funny that you say that because I am one of the most untechnical people that there is. Jim is, is much more technical than I am. I'm more the artistic side and he's more the technical side. Um, I am a former newspaper publisher, um, published um, a group of weekly community newspapers. So that had nothing to do with photography. So it was only when I retired about 10 years ago and Jim got me into photography that I really started fooling around with it. Um, and uh, Jim used to work in the music industry in the retail business. Um, so neither of us have particularly a photographic background or certainly no technical background. We love what it, great, that's all. What a great combination, what a marriage, it's <laughs> terrific. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> I put a, uh, the link there to my, my website um, our website, I should say, if you go on that, the most recent post that we have on our website was this past year's summer challenge. And we had a lot of fun with that one. <laughs> so <laughs> if you have, if you want to entertain yourselves for a few moments, take a look at our website and um, uh, take a look at our summer challenge. Is that a group? Is that done as a group within the camera club? Yes, um, every summer we don't have regular meetings. So we do this summer challenge and there's a theme every year. Like a few years back, it was these song titles. This past year it was COVID related and it was really bizarre assignments. We didn't have no idea how we would do it. So you're, it's like a scavenger hunt. You get a list of 10 things that you have to photograph and you can interpret it any way you want. But we really like it because it, you have to come up with an idea and then figure out how to, how to show it. You know, it's but, it, but it, is the shoot done as a group or everybody goes off and does it individually? You do it on your own. However, to have fun during the summer, we do get together for a meetup, usually in a small downtown. And people pretend to maybe take shots for the summer challenge, but really it's an excuse to get together and shoot for about 40 minutes and then go out and drink and have dinner. I see. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other specific questions for um, for Betsy? Well, I hope I've been able to provide some inspiration, and oh, I yes. hope that people get out and try a few of these ideas. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Yeah, um, I'm going to stop the recording here. Oh, I was. Okay.